morning, church. It's great to gather in the house of the Lord this morning. Let's all stand together. And this morning, you may notice that some of these songs might be a little bit more familiar than we're used to. And uh, over this past week, I was just reflecting on this because it doesn't matter the kind of song we sing or uh, how loud the music is, how big it is, how um, spectacular it is with the effects or whatever. Sometimes there's just simplicity and sometimes there's just, there's a beauty in the simplicity of songs that we sing. And so this morning, I just ask that as we worship together, let us reflect upon these songs. May they not just be words we say, but may they be our prayers this morning. So let's all stand together and let's sing this, let's sing these songs to the Lord this morning.
you are, for all that you have done, and for all that we know you will do, Lord. And may we respond only and cheerily in praise, Lord, glorifying you for all that we know that you are, God. So at this time, as we continue in our time of worship, be you with us, remind us of all that you've done for us, open up our eyes, we see you for all that you have done. We pray this song in your name, amen. Continue.
Good morning, church. What a privilege it is to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I want to thank the uh, young people who are up here this morning leading us in worship. Once again, we, uh, we are grateful for their sacrifice of uh, their time where they come in at least a couple hours, at least two and a half hours, if I am correct, uh, before all of us, um, because I see my son getting up in the morning and, uh, you know, he comes into our bedroom and says, wake up, mom, dad, no? Uh, I'm leaving now, so but we're still in bed and they leave. At that time, they come here, they spend the time practicing, and uh, may the Lord bless them, bless all their efforts uh, to his glory. Today is, uh, thank you, yeah, you can do that, go ahead. Today is AGM Sunday, so uh, we will be having our uh, annual general meeting following the service, so we're going to have a short service this morning, but let me start with scripture. A reading from Colossians. Giving thanks to the Father, verse uh, 12 onwards, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light, who rescued us, from, rescued us from the authority of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of the Son of his love, in, who, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And this Son, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And he is above all things. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him 
whether things on earth or in heaven. And this is the Lord Jesus that we are coming to worship. Amen? I'll quickly run through um, a few announcements. Um, as I said, we are having a, a shortened um, service this morning. Uh, so if you're new here, uh, we want to welcome here to new welcome to you to New Life Christian Church this morning. Uh, we do welcome cards in the back, so please uh, take one of them and fill them out uh, so that we could uh, reach out to you and get to know you better. Um, we also have a weekly um, email that is sent out by our pastor. It has a lot of information, including a huge prayer list as well, and also a praise list, and also there's a a number of names that are given there who are celebrating their birthday, so you can pray for them. Um, so please do sign up. If you're not receiving one of those, you can sign up for that, and uh, you know, we welcome you to do that. Um, I just want to highlight three this morning. After the service, we will have our AGM at 12 noon sharp, 12 o'clock sharp. So our regular service will end at 11.30 this morning. And as soon as it's done at 11.30, we're going to run down, use the washrooms if you have to, grab a quick beverage, and then come back up here. And if we can all assemble here by 11.55 at the latest, we can start our AGM at 12 o'clock sharp. Um, and then once the AGM is done, we can go back and uh, we can have our time of our fellowship again. A um, couple of up upcoming events, March 24th, uh, 12.30 to 1.30, young adults. Uh, they're going to be meeting in, in the attic upstairs. So the topic for them is, what is God's will for my life, part two? A very interesting topic. So young people, make sure that you mark this date on your calendar and the time as well, and uh, make sure that you uh, are part of that, um, uh, that event. March 29th uh, is our Good Friday service, and we'll be starting sharp at 10.30 that morning. So once again, please mark that in your calendars. And I'm going to call the Sunday School kids now to come up, please, so we could pray for you and dismiss you. And I'm going to invite Sister Esther to come up, pray for the children, and then um, she's going to come up and uh, um, have an announcement for us as well. If you can close your eyes, hand straight towards the kids. Our Father in heaven, creator of all life, redeemer of all things, we pray your blessings fall upon our children like spring, here and now. And we pray that you'll bless this church, uh, family efforts to grow their children in faith and in your word. We pray for the Sunday school teachers. We pray for everyone who's involved, who's volunteering, Lord. We submit the children into your hands. We pray to thee in the name of Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You can go now to Sunday school. Some of you uh, would have seen, some of you already told me that uh, you did complete the survey. It is Jesus, a two half a day workshop in the church after service. That is on 7th and 14th. So those are Sahil. Uh, Mahajan, uh, Steve, and Rob from OM, that is Op Operation Mobilization, who would be leading the sessions. It's from 12.30 to 4.30. So there are two important things here that, that we were asking you to do. One is a survey has been sent, so kindly fill it up so that all the uh, seminar, the workshop is based on what you would like to learn. So it's very important that you fill it out and also um, the deadline for this, the second important thing is the deadline for this is March 21st, that is this coming Thursday. So kindly fill it up so that we can send it to the um, speaker so that they can get ready with the sessions. And uh, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me, Pastor Tim, Deepthi Katta, and uh, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you, Sister. Esther, for that announcement and for praying for the children. Um, let's bow down our heads in a word of prayer before we hear the word of the Lord this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us the privilege of coming into your presence this morning. What a joy, Lord, that we can come freely 
and bow down before you, our Lord and our Savior and our great God, and worship you. Thank you for, for this wonderful privilege. Lord Jesus, you who are the Lord of this church, we ask that this morning that you would receive all glory and honor from us. And this morning we want to ask your grace upon our pastoral search, Lord, as we are in the search for a new man of God and to lead us and to teach us your word. We pray that you would prepare the person whom you have chosen, Lord, that you would bring the right person to us according to your will. And we also want to pray this morning, especially for our AGM and uh, what, Father, you have put on the hearts of our leaders and our pastor as we look forward to the coming year. We pray that you would give them wisdom, give us your grace, that everything would be done, Lord, uh, with reverence, and um, that in all that we, Lord, do this morning, uh, we talk about all that is um, said as we look at the reports and everything, Father, and all that, may your name be glorified as well. Time, Father, we want to thank you for Pastor Jacob, and as he comes up to share your word, we pray that you would, uh, Lord, bless him with a double portion of your Holy Spirit, that your word would come forth with your authority to all of us. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. The Lord is with you, New Life Christian Church. Thank you. It's delightful to be here today, and I've got three passages to read for us this morning. The first is Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. It's page 746 in your pew Bible, or you can just type in the words that you see on the screen there on your, uh, on your phone at home, or I'll open up your Bible app to Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. Zechariah chapter 3, start with 1. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord was standing by. And the angel of the Lord, verse 6, solemnly assured Joshua, Thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my court, and I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are a sign. Behold, I will bring my servant the branch. For behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of uh, this land in a single day. In that day, verse 10, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine and under his fig tree. Amen. And the second passage today is from chapter 1, verses 35 to 42. Let's stand for the reading from the gospel today. It's page 183. If you've got your uh, pew Bible open to page 833 to the beginning of the Gospel of John. Not the very beginning, but very soon in. John chapter 1, verses 35 to 42. The next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The, the two disciples heard him say this and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. 
the two who had heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We found the Messiah, which means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Amen. Please be seated. And the last passage is from the uh, letter to the uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 to 27. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. For the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any questions on the ground of conscience. Let us pray together. Oh, Heavenly Father, I pray that the words of my mouth, Lord, and the meditations of all our hearts are pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. A number of years ago, my wife Heather and I were um, walking in downtown Toronto. Okay, I'll be honest, it was about 30 years ago. And uh, there was a brand new building that we were walking by. And I said to her, oh, look, it's the brand new CBC building. They had moved from their old kind of warehouse location on the east side of the city over to uh, front, basically at around uh, Bay. And uh, we just sort of came up to the door and looked in. And we saw there was a kind of a gathering of people. And through the double door, someone and all the people were faced away from us. But there was one person who turned out to be a tour guide was facing towards us and kind of looking over the crowd and through the double doors, uh, the person who turned out to be the tour guide went like this. He invited us in. And we thought maybe he was waving at someone else. But no, he wasn't. We were the only two people standing there. And so we just went in. And uh, it was almost open or about to be opened. And I thought, oh, this is great. And so we walk up, and he says, oh, here's, you know, get a tag and, and follow us. And he kind of started the tour early, and we grabbed these tags, and I looked at my tag. It didn't have anybody's name on it. It just had a number, and Heather had her tag. And we didn't put them on. We just sort of held them. And because the, the, uh, the tour guide's invitation was so persuasive, we just joined this tour. We thought, oh, this is great. They must be giving public tours of the new CBC building. Well, this building went you know, way down into the basement, and they showed us a short video about, about how that building actually sits on these giant um, filled pads so that when the streetcar goes by and the subway goes by, the whole building is separated from the land around it so that the television and radio programs, you don't pick up the sound in the background, which we thought was pretty technical for just a regular tour, but, you know, that was pretty cool to see, and we went into all these has shown all these things, well, it became very clear to us that this was not just any old tour we were on. Uh, we were on a tour for, like, sound and civil engineers. They took us up on, onto the roof where they have all of the, the actual students to get them away from the street and the noise, uh, and they went into all these things, and at a certain point, people around us kind of started to look at us because, you know, very clearly, we did not fit. We were not your, you know, sound or civil engineer types. And so uh, when the moment was right, with the tour guide's back turned to us, we kind of slipped into a stairwell, made our way down to the front, and went back out on the street before we got into, you know, trouble with anybody for being on this tour that we shouldn't have been. Well, we got that kind of behind-the-scenes tour all because of the invitation of that tour guide. They were just so excited to show off their new building that he was able to call us into a tour, I can say, sort of illegally. Uh, and we got to walk all around this building all because of his power of invitation. Well, we've been dealing with, over the last number of weeks, called the six W's of the church. Who is the church? You know, we didn't start with why. 
Um, as lots of people think maybe you should, we started with who, because that's where the Bible starts. The Bible doesn't start with why. The Bible starts with who. In the beginning, God, the Bible says in the book of Genesis. We did a couple weeks on what. We did where should the church meet, when should the church meet. Last week, we talked about why go to church. And now we've come to uh, what is last of the six planned uh, Sundays, how. How can we grow our church in 2024? You know, and there might be many ways to grow a church in 2024, but I want you and I to see today from Zechariah 3, 1, from 1 Corinthians 10, from that illustration about the CBC tour guide, I want you to see that the way forward for a New Life Christian Church to grow is this, that growth by invitation is the church's biblical and effective mode of operation in 2024. Growth is going to be by invitation if we're going to grow, brothers and sisters. And I want us to see, first of, all, first of all, that invitation is predicted in the Old Testament as a sign of the kingdom's presence. That's why I read that passage, Zechariah chapter 3, which is sort of reminiscent of the uh, time where uh, Job, the issue of Job is brought up before the Lord, and Satan is there accusing uh, Job before the Lord. Well, we have a very similar kind of scene in Zechariah 3. And uh, we could talk all about who the branch is. I believe it's the Messiah, who the, the angel of the Lord is. And we could talk about Satan and all of that. But I want us simply to see verse 10. What is the culmination of that whole scene? What is the promise? What is the sign that the branch has come, that, that Israel's fortunes, the people of God's fortunes have been restored? What's the sign of the kingdom? Zechariah chapter 3, verse 10. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his and his fig tree. Invitation. Inviting our friends and neighbors into our lives, into our church, inviting them in peace, inviting them to see the good that God has done for us. This is a sign of the kingdom. Invitation will be an expression of the kingdom's coming. Invitation is the culmination of the branches or the Messiah's work. Invitation is a picture of God's triumph over evil. Uh, look up a little bit further there in Zechariah 3 and, and notice how the Lord is referred to. In, uh, in Zechariah 3, uh, verse 7, Thus says the Lord of hosts. It's interesting, that phrase, Lord of hosts, is kind of the military name for God. The, 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 the Lord of, of, the commander of all of heaven's armies. That's who the hosts are. It's meant to refer to all the angels the Lord of heaven's hosts, the sign of God's victory over Satan is that you and I can invite our neighbors to hear about the Lord. Does God want us to invite? Is creating a culture of uh, invitation at New Life Christian Church really that important? Well, think about this. What's the most beloved passage in the Old Testament. It happens to be BibleGateway.com's verse of the day today. Uh, for those of you who uh, read that verse as part of your devotions, uh, somebody yell out, what's the most beloved portion in the whole of the Old Testament? You hear it at every funeral. You hear it, you know, just about any time a pastor visits you or you go visit someone, you're not sure what to read, you read this passage. What is it? Psalm 23, exactly. Well, let's remember in Psalm 23... That sort of the, the, the pinnacle of that psalm, the climax of the action, all of the blood, the rod and the staff, he makes us walk in green pastures, he leads us beside quiet waters, he restores our soul, he anoints our head with oil. But the climax of all the ways in Psalm 23 that God, that God protects David and looks after David is what? Psalm 23 verse 5, it's invitation again. Invitation is the sign of God's victory. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Right? What's a sign of God's victory? That you can sit down even in the presence of your enemies. Enjoy a meal with God. That, that God is the one who lays out the table like he does for us on the first Sunday of every month when we have communion. And the sign of his victory is that we can come in peace. This is what I mean when I say the Old Testament predicts that 
will be a sign of the kingdom's coming. An invitation to what? To march in triumphal parade, you know, with his enemies in shackles behind? That's a, a vision of, uh, of victory coming from the, the time of the Old Testament. You know, Roman and Greek and Persian and Egyptian uh, kings, they all used to go and conquer a nation and then bring all the highest and mightiest people back to their country in shackles and walk them down the main street of their city. That was a sign of victory, but that's not God's sign of victory in the Old Testament. Is it an invitation to, to receiving the gold medal at the Greek Olympics? Our daughter is in Athens, Greece, and she's sending me these little messages. You know, she was actually in Rome two weekends ago, and she said, sent this little message and a little picture. She said, oh, we just uh, happened on the, we happened to walk by the Roman Colosseum by accident. Uh, I've never seen the Colosseum, but it looks really big in all the pictures. I'm not sure how you just end up by accident walking by it. But the picture of victory here is not of receiving the, the goal in the Olympics like they'll be handing out in Paris this summer. In fact, Paul uses both of these images of victory. He uses the, the victory parade and receiving the gold medal. What's the picture of our God's victory? It's what's pictured in Zechariah 3. It's what's talked about in Psalm 23. That a sign of Christ's victory on the cross is that we can invite loved ones and neighbors from any background, language, tribe, or tongue. We can invite them to come and sit under our fig tree, as it were, under our vine in peace is kind of the idea there. And share with them our lives and show them that Christ is the Lord of our life. And of course, this really shouldn't surprise us that the Old Testament pictures God's victory as an invitation to a meal because the highest and most important holiday in the Old Testament is the commemorative, family-based, home-based feast of Passover, as you saw in the picture just previously. A meal where for thousands of years, Jews have done what? What do Jews do at Passover? They leave an empty chair for Elijah. In some traditions, they pour a glass of wine for Elijah that no one drinks. And of course, the, the hope there is, is that there will be a guest show up you aren't able to, to you, you weren't planning on, and you can what? Because you have an empty chair, because you have a filled goblet, you can invite them in. So even embedded within Passover, the most important of all the Jewish holidays, is this idea that when the kingdom comes in its fullness, we'll be able to invite in the broadest possible way. So what makes an invitation so powerful in 2024? Well, I think there are at least six factors that make a personal invitation so powerful. Number one, we live in a low-trust world. And we have low trust in institutions. You know, who do we trust these days? You know, we, we trust our TTC drivers, right, Way? Amen? Maybe not. Okay, all right. Uh, we trust our TTC drivers. We're not sure, sir, we trust the... The, the transit people, though I know lots of you work for Metrolinks here. Uh, we trust our, our child's teacher, but we're not sure we trust the school board. You know, we trust our mortgage officer, but we're not sure we trust the bank. You know, we live in a time of low trust. And because we live in a time of low trust, people trust individuals more than they trust authorities. This is what makes your individual invitation so powerful. Number two, why is invitation so powerful? It's not dependent on access to, to what I simply call kind of gate-kept media. Your personal invitation. I'm going to hand out at the end of the service here. I've got, I've got two piles here and I've got another pile on the table out by the door. Just little invite cards. They have a QR code that leads people to our website. They've got when we meet, where we meet, our phone number, our website, and a little note to stay after the service for NLCC Connect. What makes this sort of more powerful than all the social media and uh, kind of official advertising we can do? Well, because so much of advertising today is thought to be suspect. It's thought to be suspect in some way. The third uh, thing that makes in personal invitation so powerful today is it works with our design as image bearers of God. We're, we, we were created for community. You know, we, we crave to connect 
with one another. Uh, Adam, the only thing wrong in the garden before the fall is that Adam was not alone. And you're inviting someone, reaching out, giving them this card saying, join me this Sunday at NLCC. Come to one of our life groups. It, it leans right into what we were created for, to be with one another. What's the fourth reason personal invitation is so powerful today? Well, it, in this particular city, it fights the biggest battle Toronto has right now, the battle of loneliness. Did you know that the Toronto Foundation in November 2023 published a study in which they declared our city the loneliest city in Canada? The loneliest cities in Canada, people who report that they're um, lonely or very lonely, 34% of Torontonians, one in three, Toronto, Edmonton and Calgary, 28%, Vancouver, 23%, Montreal, 17%. Brothers and sisters, uh, inviting people fights against uh, the loneliest, uh, the, the battle Toronto has right now of being the loneliest city in Canada. Um, why, why is Toronto the loneliest city? Well, Toronto's cost of living, they, they write, uh, might be one of the reasons it's earned Canada's title as the loneliest city. As reported in the study, people in Toronto face several financial hardships that exacerbate their struggles. Many have become significantly challenged by their ability to meet basic needs, such as groceries, etc. According to the Daily Bread Food Bank, demand for services have increased 295% for their services since 2019. And a further 22% of survey participants said they eat less now than they should due to financial limitations. The fifth reason your personal invitation is so powerful today is not just because it fights Toronto's biggest battle, is number five, it follows the example of Jesus. And we'll talk more about this in just a moment. And sixthly, it relies on the faith of the inviter. You know, Hebrews 11, chapter 6, chapter 11, verse 6 says, And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith is what God uses to move mountains. And when you take a card, and when you reach out to someone and you say, hey, would you join me at church? You're having faith um, in the Lord, in your church. You're having faith uh, to express that you want them to be part of your life. Well, invitation is uh, predicted in the Old Testament. Uh, I want you to hear what uh, Kenyan author Koki Oyuke has to say. Tables aren't meant for what just one person, she says. We have a table at the front of our church, not a desk, she goes on. There's a desk. That, that's a desk is meant for only one person. A desk admits one, and who holds a dinner at a, at a desk anyways? You know, there might be many ways to grow our church in 2024. But I hope you see from Zechariah 3 and soon from John 1 and 1 Corinthians 10 that NLCC's way forward, I believe, is growth by invitation as our church's biblical and effective mode of operation. Well, invitation is also the primary New Testament way Jesus' movement grew. John chapter 1, verses 40 and 41, Jesus comes on the scene. He is seen and called out by his cousin, John the Baptist. And then we read, one of the two who heard John speak and follow Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon, and what's the first thing he did? Said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means the Christ. So Andrew goes and right away brings, um, brings his brother Simon to Jesus. You know, and this is just what happens all throughout the Gospels. Does Jesus use mass evangelism? Yes. Uh, does he use miracles and healing? For sure. But the vast majority of people who come to Jesus in the Gospels come to Jesus by the personal invitation of somebody else. I've got a chart here on the, uh, on the next slide that you can see. People who brought their contacts to Jesus in the Gospels. In John 1, it's Andrew is the inviter and Simon Peter, as we just read. What is their relationship? Their brother. Uh, they're brothers of each other. And also in John 1, Philip invites Nathaniel. What's their relationship? They seem to be friends. Do you have a brother you can invite to join us? Do you have a friend you can give one of these cards to? John 2, the groom's family invite Jesus and the disciples to join them at their wedding. And what's the relationship? They seem to be neighborhood. They live in the same neighborhood. 
in and around Nazareth, with Cana being a small town outside of Nazareth. John 4, the Samaritan woman, what does she do? She invites the whole village to come out and see Jesus. What's their relationship? Their neighbors. John chapter 6, Andrew invites the boy with his lunch to let Jesus use it to feed the 5,000. What's the relationship there? Someone who showed up. He's a stranger. Mark chapter 2, there are four friends. What do they do? They lower a paralyzed man down to meet Jesus. They were friends. Zac uh, Luke 19, Zacchaeus. And who does he invite? All the tax collectors and sinners. Who are they? What's their relationship? They're co-workers. Do you have a co-worker you can give one of these cards to? In Matthew 9, there are two blind men who point a demon-possessed man out to Jesus. What's their relationship? Well, they're fellow patients, basically. In Mark and chapter 9, Matthew chapter 9, what do we have? We have a father who brings Jesus to his ill and dying son. What's their relationship? A family member. In Mark 5, we have Jairus who brings his daughter. What's the relationship? Their family. In Luke 18, we have um, uh, Jesus who's called out to by a blind man. What's the relationship? How do they connect? They're just, he's just, Jesus is just passing by. In Mark uh, chapter 8, the people of Bethsaida bring a blind man, kind of bring their town beggar to Jesus. That's their relationship. In Luke chapter 8, we're just simply told that Mary Magdalene, had all these demons cast out of her. We don't know how she met Jesus. Perhaps she brought herself to him. In Luke chapter 7, the Pharisee has a banquet and he's invited Jesus to come. What's their relationship? He's a critic. Who's the biggest critic of your Christian faith? You know, do you have a brother-in-law or somebody at work or on your Facebook page that whenever you talk or post or share something about church or Jesus, are they always harassing you for it? Invite your critics to church. Jesus was always being invited in and meeting with his critics. Matthew chapter 9, the woman with the discharge of blood sees Jesus in the crowd and just reaches out and touches him. Do you need someone? to bring you here on a Sunday? No, absolutely not. The Holy Spirit, Jesus says, is always convicting the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And people are always calling and emailing and showing up here brought by the Spirit's leading, invited by nobody. And lastly, there's Nicodemus who invites himself. He comes at night to go and meet Jesus and talk with him in John chapter 3. So do you hear all the different relationships, all the different people and all the different uh, connections and how they use those connections, no matter how strong or weak, to invite their friends, their co-workers, their fellow patients, their fellow sinners, to invite themselves to Jesus? I'm not even looking at the rest of the Testament where we can look in the book of Acts and we can see the Ethiopian eunuch who invites Philip up into his carriage, or Acts 10 where Cornelius invites Peter to his house, or the Roman church in Acts 28 who invite Paul's in to share the gospel. Paul, um, we just see all throughout the New Testament on this chart. What's your point, Jake, of running through all of this? My point is this, that in the New Testament, in the gospels in particular, everyone invites and everyone can be invited. Everyone invites and everyone can be invited. Invitation isn't something left for the leadership team or the evangelism uh, folks or just for the pastor. Invitation is something that anybody who has met Jesus or has any interest in him does in order to see people meet him. David White, the Anglo-Irish poet, has written this. A real conversation always contains an invitation. You are inviting another person to reveal themselves to you, to tell you who they are, or what they want. Brothers and sisters, New Life Christian Church, will you help our church grow this year in this most biblical and effective way based on Zechariah 3, John 1, and as we'll now look at 1 Corinthians 10, based on the invitation. Well, 1 Corinthians um, chapter 10 uh, talks about 
um, invitation, it also encourages Christians to be culturally humble and to deep and to deepen personal connections with um, other grounds by also being needed. First Corinthians 10 and the Bible wants us not just to be a, an inviting people, it wants us to be the kind of get invited. The early church just didn't invite, they were also invited, 1 Corinthians 10, 27. And, and I'm aware that 1 Corinthians 10, 27 has all, uh, has all kinds of talk about meals and, and what you're to do, but it doesn't change the, the root idea of this verse, 1 Corinthians 10, 27. If any of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. So in the Corinthian church, they were not just inviting their friends, they were also being invited out. And why do I say that accepting an invitation shows cultural humility? Because you're going into someone's home, you're going at their behest, you're going onto their turf, you're going to eat in their style. You have to moderate your desires, you have to open yourself up to them physically, emotionally, spiritually, gastronomically. You have to do exactly what Jesus did. He did not call us up to heaven, but rather came to earth for each of us. That's what the Gospel of John says in John chapter 1, that he came to that which was his own, but unfortunately his own would not receive him. And as they invited their friends and neighbors into church, they in turn were being invited back out. And note what Paul doesn't say. He doesn't say, don't go. He doesn't say that. His argument's quite nuanced, and we can get into food sacrificed to idols another day, but he doesn't say to them, don't go, even though the Corinthian church was having all kinds of trouble with the practices of their neighbors and of their past, even though they would be dining in a pagan's home, with, which was fraught kinds of religious and cultural challenges, and even though the Christian church in Corinth emerged out of the Jewish synagogue that had been kicking people out, and this was causing all kinds of trouble in the early church, we invite, uh, Paul's instructions are not simply, we invite, we are never, in, we never invited. His instructions are not, we welcome, we never go. No, Jesus was always dining in the homes of other people. Just in Luke's gospel alone, we see Jesus accepting invitations to the chapter 3, to the banquet in Levi's, Levi's house, to the dinner in chapter 7 at Simon's house, to the feeding of the 5,000. Remember, to the 5,000, what does Jesus say? He says to the disciples, you give them something to eat. In a way, it's the disciples' banquet, and he's just a participant. He's invited into the home of Mary and Martha in Luke 10. He's having dinner at another Pharisee's house in Luke 11. He's having a Sabbath meal at yet another Pharisee's house in Luke 14. He's encountering the hospitality of Zacchaeus in Luke 19. He has the Last Supper in a rented or borrowed room in Luke 22. He then, after his resurrection, continues this pattern of accepting invitations when he joins the two disciples on the Emmaus Road in 24 for a meal where it's when he breaks bread that who he is is revealed to them. And even Jesus in Luke 24 at the end of the, the gospel is eating in the presence of his disciples. What are you and I doing when we go to someone else's house? When we eat someone else's food? When we let someone else protect and care for us? What are we doing? We're saying in a low trust world, in a world where they probably haven't any, had anybody over for a very long time, in a world where they, like us, have a problem trusting institutions and authorities, when you go eat in someone's house, you're saying, I trust you. You're saying, I'm, I'm in debt to you in some way. You're saying, I'm in relationship with you. You're saying, in most circumstances, I accept, maybe even, I love you. Note that this is often the sign that your church is really having an impact on the community. Not that you invite people in, but that you get invited into conversations and places. I was at the Toronto Prayer Breakfast a couple of weeks ago, and I sat with a longtime colleague of mine who works on Parliament Hill in Ottawa, and 
on this topic. I remember uh, on this topic of being invited in, I remember him talking about that the, the real sign your church is making a difference among the political people in your uh, particular community is not that you can get one meeting with the MP or the MPP or your city councilor, but that they invite you back. Because you see, as a representative in a democracy, they basically have to meet with you. They have to meet with us. But it's when they see that there's some value, some, some connection, that we have some insight on a topic they're facing. When we get invited back into conversations, not just inviting, but when we're invited, Mel would say, that's when you know you're really starting to have an impact. Well, brothers and sisters, um, this is the point of 1 Corinthians 10, 27. That we want to be not just an invite, we want to be people of such trust and love and character that we also get invited. Take those invitations. Jesus all the time was going on to the territory of others uh, as a supplicant, as someone who's invited. Uh, at the woman at the well, Jesus says to her in John 4, give me something to drink. Peter and the centurion. So he invited them in to be his guests, the centurion does to Peter and his companions. Paul in Athens walks around that great city, and what does he say to them? He says, I perceive that in every way you, and it means like me, are very religious. The St. Augustine has written this. There is no greater invitation to love than loving first. And when someone invites us, it's an opportunity for us to love them by giving them a chance to care for us. You know, there might be many ways to grow a church in 2024, but I hope you see from Zechariah 3, from John 1 Corinthians 10, that growth by invitation should be our church's biblical and effective mode of operation in this coming year. Well, I've got three challenges for you here today in conclusion, and the worship team can come on up and get ready to lead us in our final song. Um, the first challenge is this, number one, to pray. Pray that God would open your eyes to people around you that he wants you to invite. Are there people around you from those long lists that I read? Are there tax collectors and sinners? Are there family members and coworkers? Are there friends? Are there just people in the crowd that God wants you to give one of these little cards or come up with your own way to invite them? Our weekly email that's sent out now has a, a button at the bottom that says, you know, send this email to a friend. Could you do that this week and just say, hey, here's the church I'm going to now. Look at all the stuff we, we got going on. Maybe you and your daughter would like to come to X, Y, or Z that we have there. But I want you to, some of you need to first pray. Because you say, Jake, I don't, I don't know anybody I can invite to church. Well, I want the whole to show you someone. Secondly, some people here need to ask questions. You, you can bring yourself here, but you're not sure that this that this that church in general, that maybe New Life Christian Church, maybe me, maybe leadership team people, I don't know, but you don't feel that maybe this place is safe for your friends, your co-workers, the tax collectors and sinners that you know. And so today, you need to take up the challenge to ask questions in order to build trust. I, I didn't really plan to preach this sermon on the AGM day, but it has fallen by God's presence in probably a good place. That asking the questions you have of the leadership team, myself and others, if that will help build trust for you so that you'll be more of an inviting person out there in the community this year, then by all means, ask away. Because we want you to trust us and treat your friends and family and neighbors well. And thirdly, simply invite some of you have plenty of trust. Some of you have people in your mind right now that you know you've wanted to be inviting. Well, I want you to invite. Take these cards or come up with some other way. And this week, invite one, two, three, ten people. Bring them with you next Sunday or a Sunday after Easter Sunday. This is a, the second most likely Sunday of the year this year is March 31st. The most likely will be Christmas. The second most likely Sunday is Easter Sunday. This is a great time to cards, invite your friends and family and say, would you come to Easter service with me? So take up one of those challenges today to either pray, to ask questions, or invite. Let me pray. 
our God and Heavenly Father. I'm so thankful that each one is here at your invitation, that you, Holy Spirit, have gone out into the world and into our hearts and convicted us of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. We trust, Holy Spirit, that you'll be working in the hearts and minds of those we'll be talking to, of those we'll be inviting, of those we'll forward the email to, of those we'll speak to about our faith in Jesus. And so we have faith, Lord God, that as much as you've invited us, you'll use us to invite others. In Jesus' name, amen. Please rise, let's worship together.
when he shall come. When he shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then him be found. Dressed in his righteousness alone. Faultless I'll stand before the throne. What's in the crowd? Cornerstone, the weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. God be praised. Today from Psalm 23, verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life, and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. God bless you. Uh, please join us for a meal and then back up here for our AGM. Thank you. <laughs>